Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Mark back to give us a talk. He's based at the, uh, just across the road, in zoology at the uh, University of Cambridge. Um, he's doing a PDRA just now with uh, Tim Putnam Brock, or, although I think that normally means you work on some things that are entirely intended. Um, occasional words of advice. Um, Our fact making himself into a has a long career now in predictive modeling, or sort of predictive modeling, in understanding demographic effects in population dynamics, predictive population dynamics, understanding what determines population dynamics. And uh, he's going to, to talk on these issues here today. So, welcome, Arpat. And uh, we'll take it Thank, thanks for being away. And before my talk, just a quick disclaimer uh, I do have a strong accent. So, if you don't understand something, that's probably due to my accent. So, please feel free to. Stop the talk at any time and ask questions. So by training, uh, I consider myself a population ecologist, a biodemographer, and I'm interested in the response of animal and plant populations to spatial and temporal variation in the environment. Uh, early in my career, I focused on small mammal population fluctuations, what are the underlying mechanisms of these, and there study the temporal changes in population dynamics. And then later on, I, for my PhD work, I focused on metapopulation dynamics. How do local populations interact with each other? And there I focused on the spatial variation in population dynamics. But in all of this research, I focused mainly on the numerical response of populations to environmental change. But more and more studies are now showing that populations don't respond only in numbers in quantity, but also in quality. So especially in the last decade or so, we realize that most of the population response to environmental change are accompanied by changes in phenotypic traits of the individuals. So that brought me to my uh, current research. So I'll be talking about the link between the trait and population dynamics. And I started this research at Imperial College London three years ago, and now it's continuing at Cambridge. The main idea is to link population dynamics with the trait dynamics, but using biodemographic tools. And the research capitalizes on the use of long-term individual-based data sets, including the soy sheep, the marmots, meerkats, and the silver rice, and testing some of the resulting predictions and hypotheses on a laboratory system of soil mice. And the aim is to develop a better understanding of the ecological and evolutionary processes underlying a population's response to environmental change. It's a result of a big teamwork. Uh, researchers from about nine different universities come together and they bring quantitative expertise with some of the best studied animal systems in the world. So today I'll try to... So, just to, just to yeah. remind the trivial point, were you in CPB at Imperial? Yes, yeah, not in CV, but in right next building uh, okay. uh, at the Ecology Department, working with Tim Coulson. Right. Yeah. yeah, three years at Civil Park. Okay. <laughs> so today, uh, I'll try to persuade you that by looking at the trade demography link, we can actually develop a better understanding of the population's response to environmental change. For this, I divide the talk into two parts. First, I'll talk about the dynamics of phenotypic traits. How can we investigate this? And how can we look at the underlying ecological and evolutionary processes? And next, I will link this to population dynamics. So by studying this link, how can we develop a better understanding of species' response to environmental change? Normally, when I'm giving the talk to biologists, I apologize for the equations, number of equations <laughs> that I use. So for each equation, I actually tell an interesting story. But this time, I'm not going to apologize. So. So for the first part, the case story will be the shrinking sheep of St. Kilda. So people recently started to develop an interest in the changes in phenotypic trait values in the wild. 
Several studies are showing rapid changes in fitness-related traits such as body size, wing length, body length, etc. And where these traits are, have heritable components, such changes are often inferred, interpreted as demonstrations of rapid microevolutionary change. So one very clear example is the big horn ship from Alberta. Due to selective trophy hunting of the uh, larger rams, the male rams, there has been a steady decline in both the mean body weight and also the mean horn length of the species. So because the hunters are uh, selecting for the larger animals, there is a significant decline. And the quantitative genetics analysis also shows a corresponding decline in the breeding values for these two traits. This is a quite a genetics term, breeding values. Yeah. So is it actually a decline in the mean body weight or just a decline in the average life expectancy if they're being shot know, sooner or shot more than being shot? Or? Uh, this is a decline in the mean body weight. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'm sure that there will be some effect on life expectancy too. But this is, uh, these, these graphs are just showing the, how, how the mean how you, you mean like if, if the population is younger, so the body size will be younger too. No, yes, this yes. is corrected for the ages. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, right. so because the breeding values are declining, we can conclude that the population is giving a microevolutionary response to this selective hunting. In the past, there has been an evolutionary advantage of having large horns. You will be able to survive better and breed better. But now, because the advantage is uh, going away, so having you, you don't you don't get this advantage from your parents. Is there any selective advantage from larger horns other than preferential breeding? Uh, I'm I'm sure they 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 would be quite useful for uh, as an interpretatory tool. Right. So because they these guys are living in the same environment with cougars right. and stuff. But uh, I would think that if you do a sensitivity analysis, most of the effect would come from breeding. Yeah. So that they, because they fight with each other to have access to the breeding yeah. uh, females. So this uh, microevolutionary change is often inferred from per generational change in the mean trait value. So it's a difference between the mean trait value of the offspring generation and the parental generation. And this microevolutionary change is inferred from an approach called the breeder's equation. It's a very simple concept. It is a multiplication of the heritability of the trait and the reproductive selection acting on the trait. So for a trait to change from one generation to the next, first it has to be heritable, and then there has to be selection acting on it. Such a basic approach, and it has been developed into the accounting for more details, but in general, it makes a couple restricting assumptions. One, we are assuming that the age structure, there is no age structure in the population, so the generations are not overlapping. And this is hardly the case in the wild, as, except in perennial plants. Yeah, so we, we have populations of animals where there are overlapping generations. And the second problem is, it is assuming a constant environment between the parental generation and the offspring generation. And again, this is hardly the case because we, we, we are dealing with environmental variation uh, in real life settings. So, when approaches based on the breeder's equations applied to wild systems, there is often a mismatch between the predictions and observations. Here's one example. It is not uncommon to see a positive selection acting on a trait and a negative trend in that trait. This is the fly, uh, colored flight catchers from Sweden, and the trait value is the fledgling body mass. There is positive and increasing selection acting on the trait, and there's a corresponding breeding value, positive breeding value of the trait, but over the 20 years there has been a decline in this phenotypic trait. So such contradictions are quite plenty in nature. And this led many researchers to conclude that we are either not estimating the components of the microevolutionary process correctly, these are selection acting on the trait and the heritability of the trait, or there are other processes affecting the change in the trait distributions, like ecological processes. So now, 
The new challenge is to differentiate trade dynamics that are driven by ecological processes from those that are driven by microevolutionary processes. This is quite difficult because these two processes are intimately mixed in the real world setting. So that's a, that's a mathematical problem. Uh, let me very briefly describe you what I mean by ecological versus evolutionary. Like evolutionary change in the trade value, in the trade distribution, will be as a result of differential selection. If larger animals survive better than the smaller animals, then average body mass will change from generation to generation. Some will survive, some will die. In the ecological response, it's more of a plastic, phenotypic plastic response. So every individual has the same capacity to respond. For example, if the weather is good, if the food availability is higher, all the individuals will have capacity to grow more and attain a larger size. Yeah? This is more of an ecological, plastic response. So that's, that's the main distinction that I make between the two. And differentiating between these two are, is quite difficult. And the problem gets even more complicated when we are considering populations with overlapping age structures. Environmental variation, age structure, these are nuisance parameters for quantitative genetics. But population ecology has been dealing with these for years now. And the approach is quite simple. This is a caricature, basically, this, because it's too simplified. But the general approach is we look at the effect of population level factors and environmental factors on demographic rates, such as survival, reproduction. And then use this understanding of demography to predict what's going to happen to the population size in the next time step. So one way to incorporate the phenotypic traits into this picture is to consider demography as a phenotype by environment interaction. So how does intrinsic and in extrinsic environment affect the phenotypic trait of the individuals and how this trait affects the demographic rates? And using this understanding, we can not only predict the trait dynamics, but we can better predict the population dynamics. So how do we go about following the trait dynamics in a wild population? Let's assume a distribution of a phenotypic trait, such as body size, with a certain mean value. What factors, what biological factors can shift the mean of this distribution? The, actually, if, if, if we think together now, we, we can come up with all, all possible uh, options. Let's assume that the population is closed, so there is no immigration or emigration into the population. There are basically four biological processes. Survival of individuals can change the mean trait value if there is a differential survival. The growth of the physiological growth of the individuals can change it. Reproduction of new individuals, if there is differential reproduction, if, for example, if large individuals reproduce, that would change the trait distribution. And the offspring trait value. So what, what, what is the, let's say, the body size or the body mass of the produced offspring, right? There's only, only these four processes and there's nothing else. So if you can take on, yeah. So, sorry, this so, is a, another ridiculously naive and ignorant question, so my apologies in advance, but is our, our survival, growth, and reproduction just, not just, are they, are they sort of subcomponents of, you know, what someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, like me, would call just adaptation? to a changing population or a changing environment or a changing something that mm -hmm. would change the distribution. Adaptation in... Uh, or ability to adapt. Yeah, so for example, again, one, one has to differentiate between like more evolutionary adaptation or ecological adaptation. So survival and reproduction would be more of a microevolutionary micro adaptation if there is differential survival or reproduction. But growth of the individual to the environmental conditions would be more of an ecological adaptation, right? Ecological response, I would say, not adaptation. And offspring trait is tricky because there, the mother, there can be maternal effects, which you can call ecological response. So if the mother is in a good condition, they will produce good offspring. Or there can be some heritability involved in it, which is a response to selection. But I'll explain that a little bit further. So one by one, I'll go through these. So for example, if there's differential if there's survival selection acting on body size, if large individuals can survive, this will create a new distribution 
the size of the, this distribution will be smaller because the area under the curve is the number of individuals. And because after survival, some individuals will die, this will be a smaller distribution. And differential survival can shift the mean trait value. Next, the surviving individuals can grow, especially if you are looking at younger age classes. And it's not going to change the size of the distribution, but this will just shift the mean of the distribution and also can change the shape of the distribution. Next, if there is reproductive selection acting on the trait, so if, for example, only larger individuals can reproduce, yeah, this will create a new distribution, the size of which represents the number of offspring. But again, when we are looking at a trait like body size, moms will not give birth to offsprings that have exactly the same body size, right? So there will be, you know, uh, younger ones will be much smaller. So one has to account for that difference, the difference between the maternal size and the offspring size. And this difference, as I said, incorporates two important processes. One, the maternal effects and inheritability in this trait, so which is which would allow a response to the selection. So, if you can account for these four biological processes, survival, growth, reproduction, and offspring by size, then you can follow the trait dynamics. There is one additional factor, which is a nuisance factor. One has to account for the overlapping generations and the age structure. So, for example, if none of the biological processes change, if they are constant, still there can be a change in the age structure. So from time 1 to time 2, this population grows. The number of the growth in terms of age, the number of the individuals don't change, but we have older individuals. So the mean trait value here increases. And this is just due to pure demographic change in the population. One has to, in order to understand the relative influence of the biological processes, one has to account also for the pure demographic change. So all of these come together in one big ugly equation. This is called the age structured price equation. It's not a predictive model. It doesn't make too many assumptions. So what it does is it decomposes the change in the mean trade value from one time step to the next. This is important not from one generation to the next, but from one time step to the next time step. So it decomposes that change into all of the processes, the four biological processes and the demographic process that I talked about. The first part of the equation is a contribution to change from survival of individuals. The second part is a contribution from reproduction of new individuals. So these are the components that I talked about. We have survival selection and the reproductive selection acting on the trait. We have the growth of the individuals, offspring body size, and then accounting for the pure demographic change. Yeah? So using this equation, we can take any observed change and decompose it into ecological, evolutionary, and demographic components. So enough with the equations, uh, I'll now take you to Scotland, to Arthur Hebrides. And from here, we are going to take a boat ride right into the Atlantic, to this small dot here, which is the St. Kilda Archipelago. And the largest island is the Hirta, here. The island itself, because of its natural and cultural significance, is a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve and a World Heritage Site. It's quite a fascinating environment. And the island hosts a variety of interesting species, or uh, bird and wildlife species. And among all these interesting animals, we chose the most charismatic animal to work on, the sheep. So uh, why do we sell sheep? The population, the sheep population on this island has been unmanaged for at least 60 years. And since 1950s, they have been subject of a long-term study. It's a perfect outdoor laboratory because the system is so simple. You don't have any predators. You don't have any competitors. No immigration or immigration is possible. And the system is only composed of the sheep 
the vegetation and the climate. But despite its simplicity, it's showing some really complex dynamics, population <laughs> dynamics. So it's a really perfect, relatively simplified system to study population's response to environmental change. Let's get to know the species of it. It's not too interesting, not a new species, it's always <coughs> Arius, just a primitive breed of the domestic sheep. Uh, the difference is that it's much smaller. The females are about 30 kilos and the males are 45 kilos. And this is what an adult male looks like. I'm the sheep here. <laughs> they live, they're small, they're very rugged, they can survive harsh winters, they run like antelopes. And they live up to 16 years, females and the males 11 years. They are sexually mature by six months. And the mating system is the females mate with a lot of males. They produce most of singletons every year, but every now and then they can produce twins. Why is there this five year gap between male and female that exists? Ah. Probably just being a male is too stressful because of reproductive competition. <laughs> <laughs> too much stress brings in too much parasites, but it's just I'm just hand, you know, hand waving explanation. Yeah, I, I don't know. Are females fertile for their whole life, or is there a...? Most of them, yeah. You, do, you, you see only a mild effect of senescence on the older uh, females. After, after six months, as long as there's good food, they, 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 they can reproduce. They rarely skip years for reproduction. So data for the analysis comes from this long-term field study. Every summer, a bunch of biologists jump on a boat, uh, bring the Atlantic waters and go to the island for three weeks and literally chase the sheep all around. So because it's a biosphere a reserve, dogs are not allowed on the island. So it's just like a monkey fighting show, watching biologists chasing these sheep, sheep into big traps and stuff. So we usually capture about half of the market population. And we know we have the birth year, death year of every individual. Uh, their annual reproduction, how many individuals they reproduce, who is whose mom, etc. And also we weigh the animals. We, we have a good measure of their oldest body masses. And in most demographic studies, uh, we, the males, are doomed to be regarded as pure demographic noise. So here, again, I'm only focusing on the females and not looking at the males. So first look at the, let's look at the population. Trends. This is the number of individuals at the four age classes, yearly, the lambs, yearlings, adults, and older individuals, and this is the total number of individuals on the island, uh, on the city population. So what happens is, during the first half of the study, there has been an increase with a fluctuating trend, and from which point on the population size hits the carrying capacity, and starts substantial fluctuations around this carrying capacity. So this is what we call an overcompensatory density dependence. Because these animals can reproduce quite fast, they have quite high population growth rate. And once you hit the carrying capacity, you hit it too high. And the next, in the first harsh winter, it is followed by a strong crash. And then the whole thing repeats itself. That's interesting. in 1986. Um, what, what happened is, people used to live on this island, so they were uh, until 1930s or so. But they didn't really use the sheep much for food. Their main uh, income was from harvesting the seabird colonies. But then once they left the island after the 30s, the, the population, sheep population started to increase in size because there's nothing else on the island. So it is just following that natural. Trend. And now it's fluctuating around this carrying capacity. I would expect it to have recovered carrying capacity. Much, much, much earlier, yeah. Since, no. If it's if it left in the 1930s, I would expect it to get carrying capacity. To get there much earlier. Yeah. There's something else that's going on though. It is the, the winters are getting quite milder yeah. on the yeah. island. So the winter conditions, if they were harsher than the earlier, period, they might be putting a different cap on the carrying capacity. 
But here we are interested in what's happening in the phenotypic traits. And here the phenotypic trait is the August body mass. And these are the trends in four age classes, lambs, yearlings, adults, and senescents. And on average, there has been 1% decline in the average body mass per year. The black lines are the observed mean values, and the red lines are predicted by the age structure price equation. And although it has been fluctuating, there has been a significant trend in most age classes. So, these sheep are getting smaller, and we, we don't know why. Why did that price equation use so long? Are the predictions in 1987 the result of the 1986 data? Here, the demographic did, uh, did yeah, exactly, yeah. That, that's it. So it's a <coughs> one year ahead prediction. So it doesn't start from the initial conditions and predicts the whole thing. So it's a one, one, one year ahead prediction. <coughs> Now here, we have the mean trait value for each age class. But what we will be looking at is the mean trait value of the whole population. So all the age classes brought together. So on the y-axis here, we have a change in the mean trait value. The solid red line is the line of no change. During the positive years, the mean trait value of the population has increased. And during the negative years, it declined. And on average, there has been about 80 grams per year decline. Okay? One thing that we realize right away from this graph is that there hasn't been a steady decline. Yeah? Some years it increased, some years it declined. There are substantial fluctuations. So using the price equation, we take these changes and decompose it into contributing processes. And this is what the results look like. Don't worry about which line is which. Just know that these are all the fact, biological factors and demographic processes that I talked about, there are two things to realize. One is, it's a mess. So the contribution of each term fluctuated substantially from one year to next, relative contributions. So you cannot attribute the observed fluctuations in body mass to any of these processes. So it's, it's a combination of all of these processes. The other thing is that some of these processes are always negative, like the offspring body size. And some of them are, are always positive, like the growth of the individuals, just because of their biological nature. Okay? And one way to summarize this is to differentiate, to single out the selection-related terms from the rest of the terms. So here, the solid black line is, again, the observed total change. The red line is the survival selection acting on the trait, and the blue line is the recruitment, reproductive selection acting on the trait. And all the other components are summed up in the dotted, this dashed line here. So just by looking at this, I think it's quite clear that the survival selection and the recruitment selection, which are the evolutionary force uh, behind, behind the trait change, they play a very small role in the observed fluctuations. Most of the fluctuations are explained by the rest of the terms. Yeah? The other thing to realize is that if you look at the survival selection, it's always positive. So if anything, because of positive selection acting on the trait, the body size has to increase if it was only left to selection acting on it. But what we are seeing is a decline in the uh, body size and body mass. So th th this is another contribution for the quantitative geneticists. Contribution. <coughs> And what we can do is we can quantify the contribution of each of the terms to the observed variation in the mean body size. So here we have the percentages, the contributions of each of the terms, and here we have the terms, the demographic changes in demographic composition to the survival and reproduction, the growth, survival selection, recruitment selection, and the offspring body mass. Now here you can see that the most of the variance is coming from the nuisance parameter, which is just a demographic change. We are not interested in this. But we have to account for this to be able to understand the contribution of the important biological terms. And among the important terms, survival selection acting on the trait and recruitment selection, they add up to only 5.8%. It's a quite small amount. This is, this is the evolutionary force behind the change. And the offspring by size, 
which traps any response to selection is again 3.9. So the biological process that accounts for most of the variation is in the growth term. And remember that the growth term is a more plastic ecological response of the individuals. And here these terms are all added through different age classes, so we can get a better detail by looking at the age-specific contributions. So if you look at the growth term, we can see that most of the contributions are coming from the younger two age classes. So the growth of the one-year-olds and two-year-olds from one year to the next accounts for most of the variation that we see in the uh, average body size. Until now, I just explained the variation in the body size and show that the growth of the younger individuals accounts for this variation. But this doesn't explain why the sheep are getting smaller. So to understand why the sheep are getting smaller, we looked at the, we, we searched for a negative trend in all of the contributions. And the only negative trend was present again in the land growth. All of the other terms, none of the other terms showed a significant decline, but it was only the land growth. Again, despite annual fluctuations, it declined significantly over the like 20 years. So this tells us that because lambs are growing less compared to past, this has a staggering effect on older age classes. So lambs are growing up to become smaller yearlings, and they are growing up to become smaller adults. And this affects the overall body, uh, mean body mass of the whole population. Just to understand what factors might be affecting the lamb growth, we did a simple generalized linear modeling analysis and looked at the effect of density dependent and independent factors on the lamb growth. And in general, we realized that the lamb growth declines with increasing population size. This is possibly due to higher density dependence and less food availability at higher uh, population densities. <coughs> but there's also an interesting uh, effect of the climate. The climate on the island is dominated by the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. So when the North Atlantic Oscillation Index is low, the island has bad winters. When it is high, it has really, really bad winters. Okay? <laughs> so during the mild years, the population size doesn't affect the land growth. But during really harsh winters, where food availability is limited, the population size has a negative effect on the land growth. So, with the changing climate, the form of dense independence changes, and it has quite interesting effects, the phenotypic effects. So in this first part, uh, I hope I demonstrated how to analyze the trait dynamics using a biodemographic approach. In this one case study, we showed that the plastic response to environmental change <coughs> accounts for most of the observed change in the mean trait value. And the microevolutionary force, the selection, uh, the survival and recruitment selection, it plays a very small role in this observed change. So take home message is one has to be careful in inferring rapid microevolutionary change just by looking at the phenotypic trait change in the wild. So there can be other processes, such as ecological processes, affecting this change. So now what we did is, by looking at the phenotype demographic relationships, we try to understand how the phenotypic trait values change in the wild. But as conservation biologists, we are more interested in how the populations change in size, right? So can we use this new understanding of demography, a trait-based understanding of, of demography, and predict the population dynamics. So in the second part, I will be talking about linking the trait and population dynamics, and how we can use this to develop a better understanding of a population's response to environmental change. And here, the case story will be the growing marmots of Colorado. Um, yeah. Just a quick question about the sheep. Uh, you had the a sort of a quantification for the contribution of the uh, plasticity to the changing size. Is that for the for the total uh, sort of time series? I was wondering if it's possible to 
analyze the change in that plasticity over time as to whether it's hitting some floor of plasticity or to whether it's shrinking or growing. Or it has to, doesn't it? It, can, it cannot be constant. So this, this is quite an interesting uh, point, actually, because the plasticity has a limit. And as you, as you approach the limits of your plasticity, your plastic response will slow down, but this time you will be giving more microevolution response. Uh, there will be more survival selection or uh, recruitment selection acting on the trait. If there is no variation, genetic variation, to, act, to allow that evolutionary response, then you will see a very fast numerical response in the population. That would be quite interesting to look at it, but we haven't okay. quite quite it. But it's, it's a really good point. Are you guys familiar with basic population ecological models? I will, I will give you a very brief uh, 101 overview of how we analyze population dynamics. First, we draw a life cycle graph. And here, this is the marmots. So we have four life history stages, juveniles, yearlings, subadults, and adults. And we try to estimate the transition rates from one stage to the next. Individuals survive from one stage to the next. And the reproductive stages contribute to the juvenile stage. So this reproduction, you can estimate a single rate, but often in many species, reproduction is skewed. Certain individuals have a higher chance of reproduction. So it is more meaningful to divide this into two components. The probability of reproduction, and once you reproduce, the number of offsprings, the litter size that you reproduce. Once you estimate these parameters, you can couple them all together in a projection matrix form. And this, uh, these are called population projection matrices. They basically show the contribution of each stage to the other stages. So juveniles survive to become yearlings in a certain probability, yearlings to sub-adults. And adults can contribute to the juvenile stage. First they have to survive, then reproduce, and produce a certain number of offspring. This is a good housekeeping. Once you put all everything in it, then you can use this projection matrix and project the number of individuals at each stage from one year to the next. And this is a very common approach in population analysis. Of course, this can be much more complicated. These don't have to be single rates, but these can be like stochastic. So there can be some variation included in those. Or each of them can be functions of environmental factors or dens density dependent factors. But here, we are only differentiating between different life history stages. All the individuals in this stage have the same survival, reproduction, properties, etc. Now, how do we incorporate the trait dynamics? Do you see the problem? Because the trait, in quantitative trait, is a continuous factor, such as body size. Yeah, we, and it is difficult to incorporate it in this framework. But there's a recent development called inter integral projection models. I will save the uh, mathematical details for now, but the application is quite simple. We use the same matrix. But within each stage, we divide, we let the individuals differ in their body size. So if we can parameterize this mega matrix, then we can estimate the probability of a subadult of a given size becoming an adult of a given size, or the probability of an adult of a given size producing an offspring of a given size. And if we can parameterize this, we can not only project the number of individuals from one time step to the next, but we can also project the distribution of the trait yeah, from one time step to the next. And the challenge is parameterizing this matrix. And for this, we use two coupled integral <coughs> equations. There are two kernels. One is the survival kernel. The other one is the reproduction kernel. And I'm not going to go into the details, but the components of it are exactly the same as the previous analysis, four components, survival, growth, reproduction, and offspring by the size. First, we have the demographic components, the survival and reproduction. And here, the reproduction is divided into two, the probability of reproduction and litter size. 
And then we have the trade transition rates, the growth of the individuals from one size to the next, and the production of the offspring body size. And what all we need to do is to estimate these components of the equations. And for these, we have a variety of tools, from our capture models to uh, mixed effect models. And basically, what we are trying to do is come up with these functions. For example, how does the trade value of an individual affect its survival rate? Or how does your trade value at a given time step affect your trade value at the ne next time step? So a group of demographic functions and trade transition functions. So, once we have all of these, we can easily parameterize. It is basically a discrete approximation of the integral uh, equations to the mega matrix. And using this, we are now linking both the trade dynamics and population dynamics. Just by considering the trade demography relationships, we can understand how the trade distributions change and how the population size changes. What extent are the, um, the parameters of the, the trade values completely derived from the data itself? Like, say, if you have some sort of underlying hypothesis, like mm -hmm. distribution should be, is it um, all derived from the data? In these cases, with the sheep and the marmots, we are lucky that we are able to estimate all of these yeah. relationships. Yeah. Yeah. But for example, if you want to include some behavioral if it's, a, if it's a social species like in meerkats, mm. then if you want to incorporate some behavioral algorithm into it, you can have a couple of different, for example, strategies, behavioral strategies. Yeah. So, but in these cases, the underlying models are quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. How does the body mass affect the survival and reproduction? Mm -hmm. And how does the body mass affect your growth and your offspring body mass? Mm -hmm. And those are easily estimable from the data that people have been collecting over the 25 yeah. years. I know this is a luxury, but that's yeah. it. So this is the general modeling framework. And now, this is a species that we're going to apply this model on. It's Marmotafila ventris, quite a funny uh, critter. I, I did my PhD work on this animal. It's a large, diurnal, burrow-dwelling ground squirrel. It has a formidable bite. It's quite cute, but this one has to be careful handling it. Uh, lives in the mountains western United States and lives in harems, the social groups occupying distinct habitat patches. They, for their size, they live quite long, up to 10, 11 years, and they are sexually mature by two years, and every year they produce three to six offspring. The study area is located around the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratories in Colorado, <coughs> about 3,000 meters above sea level. And their distribution is patchy and closely associated with the local mosaic of forest and meadow vegetation. This is a perfect study species for any uh, PhD student because you don't have to worry about these animals for the rest of the year. They are active for only three or four months, and they hibernate for the rest of the year. <laughs> and almost all 14 species of marmots, they, they live in the most amazing parts of the world with amazing vistas. So it's, uh, this was a great excuse for me to, I did my PhD in Florida, but working on marmots in Colorado. So this was a good excuse to escape from the summer heat of Florida. And data for this analysis coming from one of the longest term mammalian studies. Uh, Ken, Professor Ken Armitage from Kansas study, started studying this species in 1962. And I think it is only second to the Jane Goodall's chimpanzees. Every single individual has been followed in quite detail. All their behavior, population dynamics, everything has been followed. The trapping takes place during the summer months because the field site is basically inaccessible during the winter. And at each capture, we collected, collected uh, regular measurements, animal ID, body mass, and reproductive condition. And for the analysis, uh, I have analyzed about uh, 1,200 individuals captured between 1976 and 2008. Something interesting is going on in the study site. 
It's a dynamic subalpine environment, and the growing season, length of the growing season has been increasing over the years, despite the fluctuations. And this can have quite important effects on the marmot life history. Because these animals are active for only a limited period of time, once an animal comes out of hibernation, it has a very busy schedule, especially an adult female. It has to mate, uh, give birth to offsprings, wean them, and birth has a high toll on the body mass, and has to gain quickly as much weight as possible before the next hibernation, because otherwise surviving the hibernation would be very difficult, like seven, eight months of sleeping. And the change in the climate has an effect on the phenology of the species. Every year, we record the first sighting of the animals when they come out of hibernation. And on average, they have been coming out of hibernation about one day earlier. So over the 30 years of study, that means almost like 25, 30 days earlier. And for, when you consider the length of the active season, that's a quite, quite long time. And also there's a corresponding decline in the weaning dates of the young. So when the youngs come out of their burrows, especially for the last decade or so, they have been coming out really early, giving them quite enough time for the next hibernation. And how does this affect their trait and population dynamics? So there has been, this is the, what's happening to the body size of the juveniles, yearlings, and older individuals. In the past, an average adult used to weigh about 3 kilos, but over the last 10 years or so, they weigh about 3.4 kilos. So there's a quite a big increase in the average body mass. And something else is happening with their population dynamics. Here we have the number of individuals at different stages, life history stages, and the gray line is the total number of individuals. Until 2001, 2000 or so, the population has been fluctuating around the stable equilibrium. And from 2000 and onwards, there has been a steady in increase, a population boom. So when we do the uh, nonlinear regression analysis on this, the break point is given as 2001, and population, average population growth rate is basically one here, quite constant. And from this point on, there's about 14 marmots per year increase in the population, which is quite fast. So, what we did is, we divided the period into two, pre-2000 years and post-2000 years. We gave one year allowance for the population to respond to demographic change. And looked at the relationship between the trait and demography, looking at all the demographic and tra trait transition uh, functions. Remember that these functions are also the component of the integral projection model that is used to populate the matrix. First thing that we realize is that the body size affects almost all of these factors in a positive way. But more interestingly, there has been a change in how the body size affects the demography between the uh, early and later period. So when we look at the adult survival, here the gray line is the pre-2000 relationship. And the red line is a post-2000 relationship with the confidence intervals. A larger adult in the past used to survive worse compared to recent years. And nowadays, they can, they can survive much better. Now, this is quite interesting because this has nothing to do with the increase in body size. This is a response to environmental factors. So for, what we are thinking is that because the winters are getting milder, an adult with the given size has a higher probability of surviving the winter because, because it's not as harsh, not as cold. And there is a significant change in the growth of the juveniles. In the past, if you were a small juvenile, you grow up to become a small yearling. But nowadays, you can catch up with the rest of the team and then become, become quite a large uh, yearling because you, you, you have that uh, enough time before the next hibernation. And there's a slight increase 
in the uh, adult reproduction. Larger individuals can now reproduce a little bit better uh, compared to the past. Here's an anecdote. Like in the past, uh, we have never seen a yearling uh, female reproduce. By definition, mammals reproduce only during their third year. But this year, a yearling female at, uh, came to such a large size that it, she was able to reproduce, and that, that was something new that we observed. So after identifying all these relationships, we brought them all together and parameterized the integral projection model. And first we looked at how the model predicts the observed trait and population dynamics. In terms of population dynamics, for the earlier, pre-2000 years, the population uh, growth rate is estimated as 1.02, which is quite stable and matches the observed dynamics. And this is estimated as the dominant eigenvalue of the projection matrix. For the post-2000 years, it is estimated as 1.18, which is a quite a high increase. So, the model does a good job in capturing the population dynamics. In terms of trait dynamics, here we have the observed distribution of the trait for the pre-2000 years, the juveniles and the older individuals. And this black line here shows the predicted distribution of the trait for these years. With the uh, retrospective uh, mean trait values. And the post 2000 year model predicts the trait distribution, here shown in the red line, and it predicts well the slight increase in the juvenile body mass and the more significant increase in the older uh, body mass of the older individuals. So we know that the model does a good job in capturing both trait and population dynamics. But now we can use this model to understand which factors contribute the most to the observed changes in the population dynamics and trait dynamics. The only question I have is all these trait and the environmental changes do not have an abrupt change at 2000, right? But you have a very abrupt change. So what happened? Like yeah. General Motors closed their factory in Detroit? Yeah, we have no idea. That's the, that's the uh, <coughs> quick answer. We don't know what happened in 2001. The only thing that happened is I started working on the system <laughs> in 2001. <laughs> but what we are, what we are thinking is that the population dynamics quite re reaches a, a, a turn point, a threshold point. From that point on, whatever is happening in the trade dynamics is showing its effect on the population dynamics. But still we are working on the system trying to understand what might have really affected at that point. I don't think an environmental factor has changed at that point. It is just the dynamics reaching to a threshold point from which point on it's showing some abrupt response, a numerical response. I think more attention to look for a change in 2002 so we're at peak, where you would ordinarily expect it to go down. Yeah. So density dependent factors. For, from this point, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Pulling it back there. Yeah. What we did is we, we just did the cutoff point at 2000 because giving one year allowance to yeah. demographic response. In a similar way, do you reckon if you looked at all the bits where the population is increasing, would they show this same result? So. Uh, your population growth rate over the period 1976 to 2000 is around 1, yeah. but there's periods where it's probably like 1.5. Yeah, so for example, that, yeah, well, well, one, one problem is, for example, you're saying that like, compare this period to this period or this period to this period, yeah? Uh, one thing is that you're decreasing the uh, number of individuals to estimate all the uh, trade demography relationships. But it would be quite interesting to look at it. For example, group all the increase periods and decrease periods together and to have a look at it. The first question that we thought is, let's have a look at what, what really changed between pre-2000 and post-2000 years. And in terms of the trade demography relationships, what has changed between the two periods? Yeah, but uh, the, the, these are definitely doable and we should, we should follow these up with a bit more detailed analysis. So, this model gives us a mechanical understanding of the change in the trade dynamics and the uh, 
population size because it's built on the relationships between the trait and demography. So using this model, we can look at which factors contributed the most to observe changes in trait dynamics and population dynamics. And when we look at the trait dynamics, these are the contributions to the increase, observed increase in the adult body mass. On the x-axis, we have all the parameters, the survival rates of the pups and older individuals, the growth rates of the pups, juveniles, and older individuals, the probability of reproduction for the two old age classes, the litter size, and offspring body size. And only one factor contributed significantly to the change in the adult mass, which was the growth of the pups. Very similar to the soy sheep's story, the plastic response of the younger individuals accounts for most of the change that we observe in trade dynamics. So it wasn't a survival selection acting on the trait or reproductive selection. So it was mostly the growth of the pups. When we, do, we can do the same analysis and try to understand what caused the increase in the population size between the two periods. And two processes contributed the most. One was again the growth of the pups. So individuals were getting to larger body sizes, which increased their survival and reproduction. And also the change in the relationship <coughs> between the adult survival and body size has contributed quite significantly. Remember, I was saying that because the winters are milder, individuals are able to survive better compared to past. So this, this shift in the relationship between demography and the trait seem to have account for most of the change that we observe in population growth. So this, in the second part, what I try to do is to link the trait dynamics with the demography and show how you can use this to understand the <coughs> mechanical understanding of the population's response to environmental change. So we show that the climate-related change in the phenology alters both the trait development and trait demography relationships. But again, most of this trait change is due to plastic response rather than a microevolutionary response to environmental change. And the resulting change causes a decline in adult mortality, which causes an abrupt population increase. So, here we are showing this link between the trait and uh, population dynamics. So these, these two studies, once, once we publish them, because these are interesting stories, the shrinking sheep and the growing marmots, they, they, they made quite an impact on the world media. And it didn't take too long for the uh, climate skeptics, climate change skeptics, to catch on these stories. And this, is, this was my favorite one from the news of the world. Uh, they, they had a full-on attack. Uh, yeah. I didn't know how to hear about my whole days, but now I know it. Probably I was a victim of the wiretapping or something. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the two main conclusions that I want to leave you with is, in terms of the trade dynamics, a biodemographic perspective allows us to understand ecological versus evolutionary processes underlying the trade change. And in terms of the population dynamics, as conservation biologists, we are interested in the species' response to environmental change. We have a very good understanding at the organismal level, how the physiology of the animals, individuals respond to environmental change. And we have a good retrospective understanding of the distribution of the species. But we have very little information how populations respond to environmental change. And coincidentally, this is the level where we can have the most impact. Most of our management plans are at the population level. So using a trait demography approach really allows us to understand better a species response to changes in the environment. Just I'll show you a very quick uh, like summary of other applications that I'm working on of this trait demography uh, analysis. These two systems might look like cherry picking so we are trying to see the validity of this approach on other systems and we are using a soil mite system and see how under alternative environmental scenarios such trait demography relationships predict the population dynamics. 
Next, I'm listing some of the older questions, such as the decades-long enigma of the small mammal population fluctuations. And again, looking at the, how the traits, demographic relationships change to different fluctuations, we, we might be able to develop a better understanding. And currently, at Cambridge, I'm working uh, with meerkats. It's an extra complexity in the system, the social behavior. And again, your social behavior, your dominance, how does it affect your body size and how it affects your uh, demography. So trying to bring both behavior, demography, and trait values. And finally, uh, it's a more theoretical approach. All of these studies are using the trait demography relationships and looking retrospectively to how animals respond to the environmental change in the past. So can we use the same approach actually to predict an population's response to future environmental change? And I'll be happy to talk about it later today. And all, all the thanks goes to all the uh, sheepies and marmoteers that contributed to collecting this data. And thanks for listening. Thanks for a brilliant talk. I think it's for the long talk. Yeah. So no, yeah, we're over time now. See, no one's itching to come in. Uh, obviously, anyone leave if you've got something to go along to. But it'd be good if anyone wants to hang around and ask questions, just send them, please. So I'm wondering from a kind of a population management perspective, um, if you look back at the bighorn hunting example in the very beginning, and then you look at the kind of, what I took away, kind of the in at least the short term, the small influence of microevolutionary pressures on these systems. I can't think of a game management example where you couldn't stop, for example, a trait pressure like taking out the large horned individuals, where you couldn't stop that and implement a kind of a reciprocal strategy and over a decent time scale be able to retain that original trait distribution. But surely, at some point, if you did that enough, you'd start to have knock-on effects and feedback loops of those microevolutionary pressures that would take you into a new kind of trait distribution regime from which you couldn't get out of, mm -hmm. kind of a, a population demography hysteresis mm -hmm. kind of so. But we've never seen that, from what I can tell. See, we, we haven't seen... We've never seen anything where we push the population trait-wise somewhere mm -hmm. that we couldn't get it back from. So I'm wondering... Is it just well, impossible, or...? Depends, depends. If, if, if the gene is lost in the population, then it is impossible. There's, you have to wait for right, yeah, 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 yeah. mutations and selection. Uh, yeah, not impossible, but takes much longer time. Right. But if we can identify it as more of a plastic response, then the response would be very quick. Right. So, if the population has come, come back to the original this trait distribution, in a relatively short period of time, I would think that the past response was mostly a plastic response. But if it was an evolutionary response, such as, for example, the flightless birds in, uh, trapped in the Pacific right. Islands, then bringing it back to the original distribution would take quite a long time. It would be quite difficult. With the, with the uh, big on ship, uh, time will show that if they will be able to bring the larger horn individual right. back into the population. So if those genes are permanently deleted from the population or if they are still <coughs> in there. Right, yeah, yeah. Because I mean I'm thinking about like say peacock things with like ornamental effects on reproduction or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like peacock mm -hmm. feathers. Yeah. And if yeah. you start taking up peacock feathers, eventually, you know, the peacocks with the larger feathers, eventually the preference within the population would shift such that even if then you started putting positive kind of um, influences on the population to encourage peacocks with larger tail feathers. Again, the population trait kind of preference, the evolutionary preferences mm -hmm. would have changed within that population. I would think that the evolutionary preferences are much more hardwired. So they, they, they do not change that quickly, but given the hardwired preferences, they still try to go and select the peacock with the largest tail. So more than the preferences changing, the, uh, the, the sample that they select on right. is changing. And given the preferences are the same, I, will, I would think that they will still, if you let them alone, the population alone, they will still continue to select for the you know, larger 
a more colorful uh, tales. Right. I, I, I don't know whether I'm going to ask the same question that Lucas was mentioning, or I don't know this is what he meant. But I was thinking that the, the sort of might be some interaction between some of the plastic mm -hmm. influences and the what, what you call microevolutionary influences, and then, and then might be epigenetic. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know whether you've Epigenetics is, I think, the uh, un mechanism underlying the plastic response. So given the same genetic structure, environmental factors affect how the genes are uh, represented in the phenotype, right? So for example, in a good environment, mothers can give birth to larger offsprings. Right. So it's part, part of it can be caused by epigenetics. Yes, there's interaction between these two processes, but I see epigenetics as the mechanism that, that accounts for some of the plastic response. Okay. So, but, yeah. so what you described as maternal effects earlier is, a, is more generally epigenetic factors? No, no not, not necessarily, but part of, part of it okay. should be, yeah. Um, I, I think a cool concept is that it's, Given, given in this triangle here. So by being able to decompose the co in population's response to environment into ecological and evolutionary processes, we can uh, locate the population, put the population on this triangle. Yeah? So in this triangle, it gives what percentage of the response is given as plastic response or evolution response or pure demographic response. So if you can predict a population's move on this triangle, so from 10 years ago to now, if the population now has moved to here, where now it is giving much less plastic response, which means that it hit the capacity of its plastic response, and also hit the limit of its evolutionary response, which means that there's not much genetic variety left in the population, most of the response that it's going to be giving will be demographic. That means that the population will go to a harsh crash. So by looking at the population's response to environmental change today and considering alternative scenarios for the future, we can actually develop a better understanding of how the population can respond. So the extreme, if you compare for example, so that can be classified as a living organism, then you have zero plastic response permanently. Permanent, but pretty much be showing some evolution and demographic responses. Mm -hmm. so, um, if we go on that map, you have zero plastic response, and most of the evolution, and then yeah. of course there's enormous demographic variation as a result yeah. of whether it's, let's say, certain, let's say, certain, let's say certain, with the generations, you have huge number of fluctuations. True, exactly. But for example, if if you are here, no plastic response left, mm -hmm. but the population has enough genetic variety mm -hmm. to account for any change, then you, you, you might not get any demographic response to it. Because what, what has been as, uh, done by other individuals are now being done by new individuals. But if at this point, if your evolutionary response is also uh, reaching its limits, then now you'll see a huge, very fast change in the number of individuals. This, it's a very simplistic approach. Of course, there is much more detail to consider, but it's just to show that one can actually understand, predict mm -hmm. a population's response. Any other questions? Right. Again, thank you very much. Thank you.